Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Happy May. Happy May? Oh, well. We have a fascinating program today. We have an awful lot of things to expose you to. This is a, this is a strange primary election where we have candidates, and sometimes we have hardly any candidates, more, just one. At any rate, we did invite candidates today, and we have a few. But before we get to the election, which is what everybody's thinking about, right? Because it's a primary election, and nobody forgets about primary elections. But beforehand, there's a fantastic program. And it's based in Beaverton, but it's a Washington County program. Maybe some of you have heard of it, maybe you haven't. But we're going to take a few minutes, about five minutes for presentation. And then if you have any questions, it'll just be short. But I'd like to introduce you to Greg Levinson, who is a member of the awesome Beaverton Board of Trustees. And he will share with you what that's all about. Thank you. Greg? Yes, I feel very political. This is, uh, I believe, no. Uh, first, let me address the pink elephant in the room. And by pink elephant, I mean this pink t-shirt. Uh, I had no choice in this t-shirt. They just approved it and I have to wear it. So it's a pretty cool shirt though. Uh, if you're interested in, in how to get one of these amazing, or I would say awesome pink t-shirts, I'll tell you how. My name is Greg Levinson. I am a trustee uh, with an organization called Awesome Beaverton and Beyond. Uh, Awesome Beaverton Beyond is a chapter of an organization called uh, uh, from Awesome Foundation. And Awesome Foundation is basically a, uh, there's about 80 chapters throughout the United States. And we are comprised, each chapter is comprised of anywhere between 10 and 20 trustees. Uh, this is not a 501c3. We, uh, the 10, or 10 to 20 trustees, what we do is we, uh, each of us puts in $100. Uh, four times a year and so we give out four times a year we give out what's called a thousand dollar micro grant uh, to uh, individuals or groups here in Beaverton and in Washington County it is uh, because we're not a 501c3 it's we're completely hands-off so we pr give our own money uh, and from that money uh, this thousand dollars goes to um, people who present awesome projects and basically th th we have done um, a variety of different projects so far we're we're new we started in I think just last year 2015 um, and we have already um, given out four one thousand dollar micro grants uh, and uh, we said we, we, we work with this last one that we just uh, gave out was with the Shakespeare. Um, it's going to be Shakespeare in the Park at the Beaverton Round. And that was going, the $1,000 is going to go uh, for them for costumes and staging and different things. We've given it to high school, uh, a high school student who was putting together a science project um, where he was going to mentor junior high students in science. Um, at a middle school where uh, the uh, attendance uh, for science was pretty low. Uh, we've given it to a, an organization for, um, for food and for food prep um, and things like that. So uh, it's, it's what I like about Awesome Beaverton Beyond and the organization Awesome Foundation is, I don't know if you've ever seen the bumper sticker, Think Globally, Act Locally. This is, I, I believe that this organization is um, kind of one of the primary ways you can actually do that. Um, if we are working with, you know, uh, with people in need, homeless, uh, we're dealing with kids, we're dealing with arts and communities, um, but it's a very local thing. We uh, present the $1,000 to that, to that group or to the individual and What's really, again, what's really nice is it's no strings attached. They're, they can, we, we trust that they're going to use it for the benefit of what they're um, doing it for. We do ask that after a few months that they come back and give us a kind of an update. Um, and it's just a very low key way to get involved in the community. We only meet four times a year um, and it's only $100 per time. So it's a $400 investment um, where you can actually impact the community in a great way. So, with that, 
uh, after this, after my presentation here, I actually have to head out and go to my actual job. Uh, but I'm going to leave here some cards with Rob and I'll leave them on the table. Um, this is our card that we give out. It says, what would you do with a thousand dollar grant? So if you're interested, if you know of an organization or someone that could potentially be interested in using this money, um, you can take one. Or more importantly, if you would like to be a trustee uh, and be on the board or uh, be a trustee on the board with us, that would also be great. Thank you. Thank you, Greg, very much. Uh, the thing that's so neat for me, well, there's two things. One is standing to the left of this gentleman makes me feel really <laughs> cool. But the other thing that's really neat is for $400 a year, you could take your 400 and you can make an impact by sharing it with somebody or some organization. But when you add that 400 to another, well, 3,600, that's $4,000 a year that you're a part of and you get to make some decisions. I think it's pretty cool. Are there any questions for Greg? If there are, you can line up then I think it's a pretty straightforward thing. If you're interested in being a trustee, we're not asking you for donations. Don't, don't misunderstand that. Anybody who has a real need to donate money today, the Washington County Public Affairs Forum is a 501c3 status. But this organization is worth a good look. Feel free to Google it. Feel free to pick up a card. And Greg Levinson, once again, thank you very much for spending that time with us. Thank you. And now, on a slightly different note, we turn to election-related issues. In District um, 27, I have that right, Sherry, right? All right. I live in 34. What do I know? Um, in District 27, seeking the Democratic nomination, we have Sherry Maelstrom. And Sherry has up to 15 minutes to chat and questions, and then we'll move into uh, a few more political things. Sherry, please, and thank you for being here. Well, thank you for this group to inviting me to be, speak to you. Um, I am Sherry Malstrom. I've been uh, a lifetime member of Washington County. I live in East Washington County. And I have been my whole career a public health nurse. And um, I'll talk a little bit today about how my experience as a public health nurse have made me decide to run for this office. But to give you a little background on House District 27, it is the district that for the last 10 years has been held by Tobias Reed. And he's a Democrat like I am, and he is moving on for state treasurer. In this race, I started off um, thinking like most other races, I would have a whole bunch of people running against me. I drew one person that has been running against me in the Democratic primary, but he, uh, back in early March, withdrew from the race. And um, just shortly after filing deadline, and at filing deadline, um, I did not draw a Republican or an independent candidate either. So I am, in essence, running in a post, which was happy news for me, but uh, quite unexpected. Um, there is, um, it, it, just by a show of hands, any of you, I know Karen Bolin lives in House District 27. Who else lives in House District 27? And Bill, I know Bill, and a few of you. Okay, great. Well, I'll talk especially to you folks, but to everybody that wants to listen. Um, I have some supporters here, Elizabeth First, and, and, and I have um, gotten to share some times together. So one of the, the most fun things about running for office is all the people that you get to meet and the organizations you get to know. Even though I've lived in the area my whole life, um, it's been great to get to know some people. But um, I've been a public health nurse, like I said, for the last 30 years. I actually work in Multnomah County Health Department, even though I've always lived in Washington County. And I know what it takes to keep individuals, families, and communities communities healthy. That's one of the things that made me decide to run. As a community health nurse, um, people never know what we do. We take care of whole communities. We look at what is needed to help people live their best life, whether that's you know services um, to individuals or to groups. Um, I've worked exclusively with, with families with young children and pregnant women. 
So I really care about this community, not only because I lived here, but because I have gotten to know folks. Um, but I also, this name tag doesn't want to stay on me. Um, so I also care um, about things like our environment. Um, I think that we need to be responsible stewards of our environment to pass them on to our children. I think also for our children's sake, we need to really focus on good, sustainable funding for our school. The up and down nature of our funding is, is, is rather damaging to school planning, and we need to make sure that we find good revenue sources for that. I also am concerned about traditional public health issues such as clean air, clean water. You know, there's things as we've all heard about going on in Portland and we want to make sure that we have the proper, you know, um, controls with DEQ and people are watching what's going on so we protect that. So, um, I, like I said, I've lived here my whole life. I started my family um, off in, um, <clears throat> And then in um, 1991, my husband passed away, and I was left with three little kids, two, five, and nine years old. And I learned how tough it is to raise a family on one income. And so I was able to tap into resources, and like I had done for so many years with the families that I've served. So I have um, always been grateful that for that. And part of the reason I'm running, too, is to kind of pay back um, what I've gained from our community. Um, my kids and myself are all graduates of the Beaverton Public Schools and the Oregon <coughs> Universities. I graduated from OHSU School of Nursing in 1981. Um, but I want to champion cha um, changes and issues that will help us more than just get by, to get us ahead. You know, sometimes I feel like the deck is a little stacked against you know, women and low-income families. I sort of want to deal us all back in to all that kind of stuff. And I think some of the things that the legislature has done and will do in the future will do that. Things like sick pay, I'd like to champion, you know, some um, more issues around parental leave. Things that, you know, we say that we care about, we need to make sure that those things are funded. Um, we need to uh, make sure that um, we're funding for colleges is there, and I'm very excited about the Oregon Promise. I was, I'm l eagerly looking forward to working with Senator Mark Hass um, and seeing that that carries forward. But I look at education on a continuum from, what, as uh, Governor Brown says, from cradle to career. Um, I think it's too narrow to just look at K through 12. My experience has been in early childhood, um, like preschool, you know, we even know Head Start, we back that up to early Head Start from infancy through two, not just the three to five, because we know the more we can do to stimulate brain development, the more um, successful children will be. Um, some of the things that I want to do um, beyond that are looking just at advocacy roles um, for issues like women's health. Um, I've been endorsed by NARAL. Um, I've done a lot of counseling with women's uh, health issues. Um, I think that we need to make sure that everybody knows, you know, those what how those issues are impacted. Um, I've been a commissioner for women, and that means I was appointed was one of those governor appointments. And uh, in that group of women commissioners, we look at legislation that may uh, have some unintended consequences for women or minorities. And we make you know, suggestions for that. We also try to do things that might you know, encourage changes that might need to go on. So um, I am more than willing to take questions. I could ramble on and on and on, um, but I think that um, my experience has been in the legislature, uh, one of advocacy. I've been, for the last seven years, the pr president of the Oregon Nurses Association Political Action Committee, and so I would regularly go to the legislature and advocate for changes that the nurses um, were you know, concerned about. Most of them were things that just affected families. I've testified on things like e-cigarettes, uh, making sure that women weren't dumped off of their um, insurance by employers at the end of their pregnancy, things like that. Um, you know, marijuana legislation, you know, on from there. So um, I'd be more than glad to take questions from any of you. Anybody have some questions? I don't. 
tell you, we can't even provide the opposition that you're not having. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here we go, here we go. It may not be an oppositional question. Okay, well that's fine. I love a good debate, so. Where, do you have a question out there? Oh, right here, good. At least he tells me this. I tell you that. Right. Chris Leslie, former member. Nice of you to come here. And I'm just going to ask you more a question of personal responsibility. Don't you feel that uh, people nerd, uh, need to learn personal responsibility and not have all these, uh, shall we say, handouts? Absolutely. I don't think we need more programs per se. I think we just need to make sure that the services that are out there um, people know how to access them. But um, I do think that's personal responsibility, and I think part of that goes back to making sure that little children, from the time they're very little, you know, are getting the things that they need. And if it isn't in their homes, how do, how do children learn those things if they are not, you know, necessarily have the advantages of being raised in a home where those kinds of things are taught? So I think, you know, um, community service is a great way. Um, for kids growing up, even younger kids being able to participate in things that help in their community. But I do think that we need to um, make sure that that happens as much as we can. I mean, more in the sense of being responsible for the children you do have and you raise, like you right. said, you had a problem with uh, right. being That's a difficult. single mother. Uh, people who just have children out of that's one of the reasons I'm, I support a woman's right to choose. I don't believe a woman should be forced to have, you know, raise a child if she doesn't want to. If she doesn't want to become a parent, I think a woman should be able to choose if and when she wants to have a child and how many children to have because that is the number one reason uh, women do not want to continue a pregnancy is because they feel that they can't afford it. And if that's how they feel, then I feel that they should have the right to make that choice. Thank you. Hi, Sherry. Uh, really nice to see you here today. Uh, John McWilliams, a board member. Um, I uh, have a question about um, health, and I was kind of thought that you probably might have some input into that area. Uh, so per, we've been talking a lot about public health. I was kind of wondering, because we have a lot of people right now who seem to have a lot of mental health problems, yes. and so I haven't heard anything about uh, how you might work with that or deal with that, and I think that could be a big big need to talk about down in Salem. Yes, that is a huge need, and I think we're finally getting a little more traction. People like yourself are asking more about that. Um, I know that um, Washington County is looking at having um, a center out here um, for where what happens to people when they're having mental health crisis is they don't necessarily know where to go. And unfortunately, a lot of them, if they're in crisis, they get picked up by the police. And that is not really a, you know, a police issue, but what happens is they get called off to jail, they get further traumatized, a huge percentage of people with mental illness have abuse issues in their past, and it just triggers all that for them to be handcuffed and thrown back in a police car. They get thrown in, back, oh, into jail, and then they're quite right back out. So we need to keep them out of the justice system. I mean, many of them, not all. I mean, some of them do have criminal problems, too. But most of them simply need you know services, but they need to be assessed and not, and not necessarily thrown in a, in a hospital necessarily. They may need um, just some good assessment. So that's what we're looking at to doing in Washington County. I know Multnomah County is doing the same thing. Um, again, that's part of one of the things that we need to do for um, funding is to look at that. Because if we don't and, you know, take care of these folks, they can't become productive members of society. I've had, in, in my work, with families. I find I've had so many people that have been referred to community health nurses because they are really falling apart and they're not participating in society. They don't work, they don't, they can't work, um, and they need help. And if you can get them some help, they can eventually return. And instead of being, you know, taken care of, you know, by government services, they can take care of themselves, but they just need a little help to do that, so that's it's it will save us money in the long run. 
Thank you very much, Sherry. All righty. And I have some flyers here. Do you want me to put them, put them on the back table would be okay. great. Thanks. And Sherry, I noticed that there were a couple of folks that wanted to ask you some questions, and I'm the one that told them, nope, we don't have time, just because there's so much going on here today. I hope you'll be able to stay through the program, and perhaps these, great. Perhaps you can find her, those folks that had questions, and get her off in a corner somewhere and get a good answer. So thanks again, Sherry. Now we're going to take a look at 26. Pardon me, 28. I tell you, it, numbers and I don't get along. My math teacher from high school would confirm that. At any rate, we're going to look at District 28, and we have two folks seeking the Democratic nomination. We have the incumbent, Jeff Barker, and we have Gary Carlson. Oh, I'm, t I'm so sorry. Thank you. Uh, I'm flexible. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure each of you will work with both parties, but if you'll hang on a second, Gary, I, I, if you'd like to come first, that's okay. That's great. Let Gary talk a little bit about what he's looking for District 28, and then we'll hear from the incumbent, Jeff Parker. Excuse me. Thank you. Gary Carlson, a former member, and glad to talk to you. And glad to have you here, Jeff. I've been to some meetings with Jeff, but never had a big conversation because he's always got all these other people around him. I love Democrats, I love Republicans. I think Democrats and Republicans are trying to accomplish the same things. It's just a matter of how we get there. So that's where I come from. I'm from Montana originally. I was raised in Montana where we we're cowboys. The Women rode the horses and the men threw the bull. And it was one where you kind of learned to take care of yourself uh, a lot. And we had 800,000 people in the whole state. And my background is such that I've had a lot of a kind of experience. A lot of people like to say they'd be able to relate to people. And so a brief little quick resume of myself is that I started working in a service station. And I worked in a service station from the time I was 11 years old till I was 22. So I can relate to that. I also fought forest fires. I've been in the farm area because I've driven scatter rakes and buck bales and things like that. I was going to be in television and radio as I graduated from high school. I ended up coming out to Portland because that was the kind of the end of it to go through a program. I was 17 at the time. Uh, the Mr. Ed Smith. Uh, uh, was a salesman for KPT Television, convinced me I was too young, so I went back to Montana, enrolled in the university, went through that, uh, went in through law school, became uh, appointed to the, Washington, or to the Montana Supreme Court as a law clerk, so I've been in the court system. And then I was an attorney with the National Labor Relations Board for two and a half years, so I've been on the prosecution side in federal courts. I then went with corporations, and I was with General Telephone Electronics, which is now Verizon, for, as labor relations manager, compensation manager. After about two years up in Everett, I went back to New York City for two and a half years. So I've lived in the big city and the small cities. I've gone both ways there. I learned there were two things living in New York. Number one is there's things I won't do for money, and one was to live back east, and the other one was that I was a Westerner, so I ended up coming back here. I became vice president of Rydell International, which is here in Portland, so that's dealing with the tow boats and the dredges and heavy construction, built the east end of the Fremont Bridge. And then I went into private practice, and I thought I was a labor lawyer, but it got expanded into other kinds of things. So I did a lot of uh, criminal law, had 34 murder cases, eight death, death penalty cases, the robber, burglar, and rapist. Uh, I've had all kinds there. That led to family law because family law is the easiest cases to get. 50% of the people that get married get divorced, so there's lots of them around. And then that leads to trust and wills and estate planning, so I developed a general practice. Uh, we also took care of personal injuries as they came up bankruptcies if everything went haywire. So I've had a lot of variety of experience. I ran in 1978 for a House District 9 up in Portland. And that was when Mary Rieke had passed away. And I was starting the practice of law, so it was kind of an advertising campaign along with everything else. And it was very, very interesting. Uh, Reagan was running at the time. Governor Tia was the governor. And so I met a lot of people. I took third out of six. And the others, uh, the one that 
took first, uh, was the wife of uh, first interstate bank vice president, and then the other one was the head of the Nurses Association. So that's kind of my background. So I've had a lot of experience in a lot of areas. As a lawyer, I also get an opportunity to look at the law and see how good it is or how screwed up it can get. And the reason I'm running is I'm unique. I don't have a single law that I want to go down to Salem to pass. Most people have five or six laws they want to go down and pass. My feeling is that we've got too many people passing too many laws and regulating too many things. I think we end up trying to solve too many problems rather than focusing on the, point, the areas where the government really needs to be involved. And I figure if we can kind of weed the garden and kind of look at the laws and the rules and the regulations that take place and then start weeding them out a little bit so that we can spend more time and money getting the things done in a narrower area. But as I said, I believe that both people, Democrats and Republicans, want the same things. We want great schools, we want a great economy, we want to create jobs, we want to create all the problems for the people who have difficulties. But there's about 10% of the people, 10-12% of the people, they either can't work, uh, they have de deficiencies where they can't work, won't work, some people just don't want to work, some people have numbed themselves with drugs, they can't function. So there's a certain group. And I believe in taking care of those that really need it. <clears throat> Place where I think government goes wrong is they start trying to solve the problem for everybody. And when you do that, then you pass rules and regulations that make life very, very difficult for people. I had three people that had a very difficult time just trying to get a driver's license because the law is okay. It's kind of broad. You have to be a U.S. citizen or a legal resident. But when you get down to the details, they get, and you have to have a certified birth certificate or a passport. Now you've got to be a member of an Indian reservation in the Oregon area. And I had a lady, she just didn't have a certified birth certificate. She'd gone through the DMV locally, couldn't get it because she didn't have the certified birth certificate. She had a birth certificate, had the name of the attending physician on it and the high school administrator, but it wasn't certified born in Cal California. She wrote down there and they said, we don't have a copy that ever got registered or certified. And wrote to Sacramento, same thing. Came up here, uh, I, she got a hold of me and said, I need help. So I figured it wasn't very difficult. I ended up uh, finding the same problem. Local DMV, they can't do it, don't have the document. Next was down in Salem. They said the same. There's an omnibus man that's supposed to help people get a license same kind of reaction. I reached out to a Democrat, Tobias Reed, and I said, hey, somebody's got to have some common sense down there. Who do I get a hold of and how can I uh, get some input? He said he'd try, couldn't promise me anything. That was on a Wednesday. Thursday, I got a telephone call from DMV and they said, oh, she can pick it up on Friday at the DMV. Shouldn't have to go through that. The rules and regulations all have good intentions but we go and we regulate too many things too much. And so I'm there to kind of be a squeaky wheel, kind of weed the garden and say, do we really need to be regulating this? And do we really need to get into all the details of trying to figure out what people can say and think and eat and et cetera, et cetera. So that's why I'm running and that's where I'm coming from. Terrific. Uh, and now we'd like to get a chance to listen to uh, Mr. Barker, the incumbent, and then we'll have time for questions. When people do come up and ask questions, please indicate whom you're asking the question of, both candidates or, or one. And I notice, too, that, of course, you have not, you're running against two other folks for the Republican nomination. Um, and I certainly wish you the best. Uh, but I believe the incumbent is running um, unopposed. Mr. Barker, please, and thank you for being here. Uh, thank you. You can see I'm wearing my suit today. I came down to lunch. I just got back from a uh, long vacation with my wife down in Southern California, drove in yesterday. And I said today, oh, it's Monday, even though I'm not finished unpacking, I've run down to the forum meeting. And then somebody said you were speaking today, which was a little bit of a surprise. But here I am. So I'm Jeff Barker. I'm a native from Portland, Oregon. Grew up there, went through the public schools in Portland. I graduated from Benson High School 
And then I went in the Marines right out of high school, served a term in the Marines. My dad died while I was gone, so I came back home, helped my mom out uh, at the time. And then I went on, went down to Portland State and I went in and said, I'd like to go to college. And they said, what are your SATs? And I had to ask what those were. So they had me take the test and I got in, I got in by walking through the door and signing up. And then I went, uh, graduated from Portland State with a bachelor's degree. Didn't quite know where, what I was going to do, and I ended up working for the Oregon State Police because I thought I'd like to be a game warden. And I worked traffic for a year, and then I was a game warden for a few years. But I didn't like the internal politics of the state police, so I went to work for the city of Portland, where I spent most of my law enforcement career. And I retired as a lieutenant in 2001. Uh, I went through the ranks as a patrolman, detective, sergeant, and then lieutenant. Had a, a good career there, and when I, right after I retired, my wife and I had planned to do a lot of traveling, or at least some, and we were traveling into a little convention in Washington, D.C., and it happened to be we were there on September 11th, 2001, during the attacks. And we were on a boat like the Spirit of Portland going down to see Mount Vernon. My wife had wanted to see that one other time we were back there and we couldn't get down there, and I said that morning, I said, why don't we go take a tour of the Pentagon? And she said, no, I want to go to Mount Vernon. So I have to listen to everything she says from now on, from that date. <laughs> but we were uh, going down and I overheard another conversation where somebody got a phone call about the attacks in New York, but nobody knew what was going on at the time. And I'm, I'm getting some chills just remember, reliving that event. And a short time later, I noticed, uh, if you've ever been to Washington, D.C., uh, Reagan Airport, Planes come in one after another. It looks like a string of pearls coming in there. And all of a sudden, there was no planes flying. And I looked back and saw a big flame and smoke. And I thought it was the airport. I assumed a plane had crashed. And I asked the captain of the boat what had happened. He said he didn't know. And I said, you know, there's been some kind of an attack in New York. Both those towers have been hit. He didn't know about that. So he called and came out and said, either a plane or a bomb hit the Pentagon. Well, just from the, the fire, it was pretty clear it was a plane. We were ordered back to the dock, literally sailed through the smoke of that fire and then had to walk back to her hotel because uh, everybody was trying to leave D.C. at the time. And then they wouldn't let us go to our room because it was on the top floor. But it was a very traumatic day. We, I ended up telling my wife, let's go get blood. And we went to the Red Cross and they weren't taking blood. And they said, call here, call here. The phones weren't working, trying to get a hold of the kids. But anyway, at that day, I told my wife, I'm going to do something besides be retired. And that's a long story short how I got involved in politics. I was approached once I got back here to run for office. I did. Had a very contested race back in 2002 against a very fine young man, uh, Keith Parker. Some of you remember the Barker Parker, a little confusion going on there. And uh, I had the closest race in the state that year, won by 40 votes. So every vote does count. People you know, often joke about that, but that's a very true thing. And I had the support of uh, Congressman, Congresswoman first for that election. And when I was a police officer, I was active in the union. We go back to D.C. to lobby for uh, things like the 457 plan for retirement. You could fund some of your own. And I got a lot of help from her and her office there. So that's kind of where I, where I came from. I uh, ran for office down there. And I told people at the time I was running, I'm not a Portland Democrat. I'm Morrison County Democrat. And I've been as bipartisan as I possibly could be during this the time I've been down there. I've had some tough uh, times when I voted against my caucus. Uh, and one of the toughest votes I took where I voted, where I said no, was there was a land use issue where somebody had been worked all the way through the land use system to open up a, a uh, kind of a green, uh, I'm going to say lodge up, up by sisters, and suddenly it became, it's too close to Metolius, and so people started changing the rules after the fact. And I really didn't like that, and I said, this guy had done everything he was supposed to do, he should be able to build that. I got a call on a Saturday afternoon home from uh, Governor Kulinkowski, who, who I uh, shared some friendship with. And he was, had been a Marine, so we had a, a pretty good connection about that. He said, I really need you to change your vote, board for, vote for me on that. And I said, you know, Governor, I'd love to do it. I really respect you, but I'm, this guy did everything right. And if a Republican governor was to call me up and say, I want you to change your vote on a land use issue, I would tell them no, and I'm, gonna, I'm sorry, but I'm telling you no. And that, and I did not vote for that. It, uh, it ended up they got somebody else changed their vote, and then got a good government job right after that. But uh, <laughs> I didn't need another job. So anyway, I, so I, I've had those kind of issues come up. The, this last session was a little more cantankerous than most. It, a lot of that came out of the Senate. I had two bills that I worked on pretty hard that I was disappointed didn't get through. One of them was after the incident over in Eastern Oregon. 
the there's a bounty out on the officer that shot Lavoy Finnegan. They didn't know they the name of that officer wasn't released. So the superintendent of state police came to me and said, I have a real problem. They're going to kill this guy. And, and so we need to be able to protect his name. So I drafted a bill, called the ACLU right away to, to talk to them about it before I even moved an inch. We had a bill that if there was a viable threat against an officer, they could go before a circuit court judge and get a protective order that would last 90 days. Uh, I thought it was a reasonable thing. It passed the House with 55 to 3. The Senate killed it, and I don't. I still to this day don't know why, except that the President, uh, Peter Courtney, was seemed to be completely discombobulated on that side with the Republicans really giving him huge pushback and everything. Uh, so that was a huge disappointment. The other thing was, I had a bill, I'm Second Amendment guy, but they're, they're, if you go to buy a, a firearm and you do a background check and you don't fail it outright, you're not a felon or something, but there's some problem. For instance, there may be a Jeff Barker in California that was a felon, so they, they're not sure it takes a while to check it. And the law says after 30 days, the dealer can release the gun. The dealers won't, because who would? If you're not sure somebody's not a crook, you're not gonna take the liability on. So I worked with the state police and said, here's what I'd, uh, I'd wanna do, a 10-day waiting period, but, in the, but also we'll, we'll fund the state police more so they can have more people working in that unit to get those things resolved quicker. And uh, so we sent over a million dollars there. And if you have a concealed handgun license, means you've had the background check, you go to the top of the line when, you call, when you're going in there to get that. So the, and then, once again, it went over to the Senate side and I was told it was too confusing. And so they, they killed that. And I was really disappointed on that because I worked really hard with everybody uh, with a 55 to three vote would indicate that. Uh, there's a lot of things we were talked about a little bit earlier, uh, the, mental, the mental health and the, the uh, people with responsibility having too many children or having children when they're not ready. I, I really support good sex education and contraception availability. We, I don't like abortions, but I su absolutely support a woman's right to do that. That's a very tough decision for the woman, and I certainly don't think old men in Salem ought to be making that decision. It's up to the women and their families. And, but, it, but I just uh, saw a note the other day, I think it was in the, in the New York Times, that said the birth rate, uh, un, unmarried teen births are dropping in all categories, which was, is good news. And they said some of that's because of better contraception availability, some of it's the implants where they can do, and some of it's because kids are learning, they can say, no, I'm not ready yet, I'm not gonna have sex. And whatever the reason is, it's great to have, not have unwanted children, and we all know what happens when some young girl ends up with a baby and then the guy takes a hike, she's stuck. I mean, it's really tough. And, you, the, and as a cop, 31 years, most of that was in a blue shirt, you know, wearing a harness cop. I saw those families suffer and, and, uh, and the mental health, I saw all of that. And so anyway, I just try to work. I work very closely with my Republican counterparts uh, as much as I can. We don't always agree, of course, but we do agree. I agree with, we're all trying to get the same thing done. We have different ways of doing it. And uh, I just, anyway, I've, I've been proud to be re to represent this area. This is the, my district right here where we're sitting in it. I just live up the street. Uh, I didn't, one other thing I should have mentioned about my family. I have two grown daughters. Uh, my younger daughter is a journeyman electrician. She's a project, been a project manager uh, on one of the big Intel builds out here. Just She just finished the Daimler building uh, headquarters on Swan Island. My older daughter is, a, is an attorney. She was a prosecutor for 14 years in Portland. And she's the governor's uh, public safety policy advisor now. Uh, works for uh, Governor Brown. Um, my wife Vicki and I uh, will celebrate our 50th anniversary this year. So, as I introduce her, she's my first wife. You know. So. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, well, thank you very much. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to speak, even though I didn't know I had it today. So. Thank you, Mr. Parker. For two gentlemen who didn't really know that they were speaking today, frankly, both of you have done very, very well. This isn't so much a look at each candidacy as much as it's a look at the district. Uh, we have about 10 minutes for questions before we get to hear from our next candidate for Justice of the Peace. Uh, we've got a questioner right now. Again, please identify who you're asking. Hi, Bill. Uh, I'm Bill Kroger, forum member. This is for who, either one of you or both if you want to respond to it. Uh, not a day goes by uh, where on TV you don't see something about homeless people in Portland or in Multnomah County, and it's just, it's a mess. I mean, it's a real mess and it's a serious problem, and it 
looks like it's going to be spilling over the borders and stuff pretty soon. I'm just curious, is there anything the legislature can do or should do to be addressing the homeless issue? Yeah, so I, I'm appalled by what's going on in Portland. The, the, the hazelnut village, those kind of things are, are, don't make sense to me. People need to be, some people need to be helped. Some don't want to work, and I'm not sympathetic to them at all. But you have the mentally ill, you have the other people drug affected that, that can't work. Legislature uh, is trying to do things on mental health. I'm the chairman of the Judiciary Committee down there, so I'm doing the, more of the law stuff uh, with the, you know police cameras and all that kind of thing. But uh, we all need to work together to try to re resolve that. But I, I don't think allowing people just to come to town, the, the travelers, the warriors, road warriors as they call themselves, and take over downtown, that's a mess down there. And it's dangerous. I mean, besides the fires, the drug use and everything, it's just, I, I wish I had a better answer on, on how to solve that. But I, if I was the mayor of Portland, I would be doing things differently. Obviously not an easy problem, but I do think it requires some of the stuff I was talking about. You kind of have to focus on who really needs it and who doesn't. And when you're looking at welfare type approaches, uh, the people that need the food, housing, and clothing, it's figuring out how can you do it economically and efficiently. And I know <clears throat> used to be they, they were very worried about the dignity of how you hand the, the stuff out. Uh, but I think focusing on it. In other words, and I'm not sure whether this is a total answer, but it's the kind of thing that you have to think about. Like military barracks, you know, you could build barracks relatively inexpensively. And if people just need food, clothing, and shelter, and if they're homeless, they kind of fall in that category, you could probably build all of that stuff fairly economically and have it available for them. You'd have a section, you get five acres or whatever it is, you have to do it. Just like the military did when they were bringing people in. They'd have a place to stay. You could have common areas for showers and bathrooms and things like that. You could provide food for them, and you could uh, have that kind of thing available. Some people still may not want to do that, but that'd be their choice if they really didn't want to get into it. But it'd be available, and you could do that relatively inexpensively. So you kind of focus on the problem, find your out solution, listen to the alter alternatives, and then get it done. So that would be part of the approach. Um, Jim Cape for a member question for both candidates. Um, last decade, there was the annexation meltdown. Last year was the grand bargain between the Beaverton and the Loa politicians and bureaucrats who had to have state government and the state courts fix the local problems. I mean, citizens and property owners wasted a lot of time speaking to Beaverton and the Loa politicians and bureaucrats to solve local problems, yet nothing happened. So why is it that Beaverton and Aloha politicians and bureaucrats couldn't handle the annexation meltdown and the grand bargain, and they had to wait for the state government and the state court system to solve the local problems? Thank you. I'll go first. <laughs> okay. Um, it gets to part of the problem. I mean, we have federal laws, and then we have state laws, and then we have county laws, and then we have local laws, and then we have um, other kinds of agency laws and rules and regulations. So you keep stacking it up, and pretty soon it smothers a person so people can't function. They can't get anything done. There's always reasons not to do things. And you should be taking care of all of these things at the lowest level. At the federal level, they've got a lot of things they are imposing on states, and we don't have control over that, but we should be trying to get them to figure out things that are really important under their function as a federal government. And then the state government has an atmosphere creator. And that's what I'm talking about, creating an atmosphere where people can be, succeed and thrive without the burden of unnecessary or not too bright rules and regulations. And I would, I would agree with that. I uh, worked with uh, Representative Brian Clem out of Salem, worked a, a hard to try to get that thing resolved, and he, he, you know, the grand bargain. He did quite a bit of work on that. I also had him contact somebody I know who was having land use problems out there, uh, a thousand friends of Oregon, uh, I'm trying to think of the lawyer's name, who, who's done a lot of stuff. Uh, Dave uh, Honeycutt worked with him on some of those issues, too. It, it, it's tough, but there are so many layers. Metro's another layer in the middle of that, so thank you. Chris Leslie, former member. 
question for both of you gentlemen. <coughs> the idea of uh, legalized marijuana and the concept of it being a gateway drug, isn't that going to add to the mental problems and the homelessness and the class distinction between all our peoples? Jump up first on this one. Thank you. Uh, so I have some great re reservations about, especially with youth, who are going to have be able to get a hold of it a little easier. Uh, it, it seems to me, for especially for young people, you don't say marijuana and accomplishment in the same sentence, but. It's a waste, a huge, been a huge waste of time for, for to lock people up over marijuana, uh, in my opinion. And uh, Oregon hasn't been locking people up for marijuana for some time unless they were delivering it by the truckload because they, they recognized that. The public voted on that. The public said legalize it, and so that's what happened. Uh, a couple of years back, the, the, there were some uh, legislators who wanted to send out to the voters do you want to legalize marijuana, yes or no? And if the answer is yes, that we would have written the law. That was stopped on the Senate side again. And so it went to, they did initiative, it was passed, and now the legislature will be spending the next decade at least trying to do the minor repairs to that thing. It, I, I don't know about the gateway. I mean, there's, everything's a gateway. The alcohol's a gateway. Uh, uh, so, and a lot of people, you know, they talk about, well, now people will be smoking marijuana. A lot of people are smoking it already under the medical marijuana thing. You know, you say, I, my back hurts or I can't sleep or whatever. You need to see, there was one, I, I think it was a chiropractor that issued most of those licenses. He got paid, you know, you go to a motel, he'd sign you up and zip, and now they, they restricted that. I'm sure there are people that that helps as medicine, uh, but not the 150,000 or whatever had the cards. That people are using it. So I don't know it's gonna be a sea change, it's different. and. Uh, I, I, like I say, I worry about the youth issue there, but uh, the, the, nationally it's, it's turning. You know, more states are going medical, and then there, I think we're, there's four now that are, where it's legal. California is going to flip this in November, I think, too. They have that coming up. So that's the best I can tell you. It's, it is different, though, especially for those of us who didn't grow up in the, where everybody had it all the time. Thank you. I think we're pretty close on that one also. <laughs> Uh, back about 1975, 6, 7, 8, they said there was a $500 fine if you got caught with less than an ounce of marijuana, and so people quit going to jail and they paid a $500 fine. But my, my solution to the marijuana problem would have been to treat it like dandelions. In other words, if you're going to give it to everybody that wants uh, for medical purposes and you're going to give a marijuana to everybody that wants it for recreational purposes, you've already given it to everybody. If you're going to give it to everybody, then why regulate it? You don't need to regulate it. When you look at the regulations, they did it primarily because they want money, <laughs> and they get a lot of money coming in on the regulation. Problem with that is, as you increase that <coughs> money that's coming in, you increase the bureaucracy that administers it. So the Oregon, Oregon Liquor Control Commission has to have more people driving around and seeing if people are selling it properly or not properly. And that creates a bigger burden there. The tax people have to spend more people bringing in money. So you've increased the revenue, and you've increased the cost, and you've increased the bureaucracy, and you've accomplished nothing. If it was just grown like dandelions, everybody could get it if they wanted it. But after a while, those that didn't want it wouldn't pay any attention. It'd be like I smoked driftwood when I was a kid growing up on the beach. It's the same thing. And Mexico wouldn't be sending in a bunch of people here to sell marijuana because it wouldn't be worth anything. It wouldn't have any market value because it'd be growing in their gardens or in the woods if they want. Gentlemen, thank you very, very much. We really appreciate your candor and your questions and your presentations. Thank you. Before I have the opportunity to introduce our last guest of the day, I wanted to explain that in booking speakers, when, whenever there's an issue or there's candidates, we do our best to invite everybody. And sometimes we get responses, people can't come. Sometimes we get responses, people will come and they can't show up at the last minute, things happen, that's just life. Um, and we tried to do that with all legislative races. We received a, um, an inquiry 
from one of the candidates for justice of the peace last week or two weeks about is there a spot for me to present to the Washington County Public Affairs Forum and of course we're very interested if people would like to share with us we're interested in hearing and so I simply responded yes without checking um, as to whether or not there was an opponent so I need to own that uh, and I'm about to introduce a gentleman who is running a race and we will not get to hear from his opposition today and that is not his fault that is mine so I apologize to the group and with that I would like to introduce candidate for the justice of the peace Dan Cross thank you Dan the first time anybody has told me that lie in a long time. <laughs> As I said, my name is Dan Cross and I'm running for the Justice of the Peace of Washington County. I have lived and practiced law in Washington County for over 20 years. Um, I have had my office in downtown Hillsboro since 1999. The focus of my law practice uh, for the entirety of my career has been in juvenile law and in criminal defense. I have had the good fortune to be, I believe, well regarded in these areas. Uh, I have served on the board of directors of the Oregon Criminal Defense Lawyers Association, and I'm also a past president of that organization. I also served, had the honor to serve, on the uh, Chief Justice of the Oregon Supreme Court's Criminal Justice Advisory Committee, and uh, was recently named a top 100 criminal defense lawyer by the National Trial Lawyers. Uh, it's been kind of an amazing journey for me. I'm, I'm just a kid from North Dakota. I know Mr. Carlson's from Montana. I'm not going to hold that against him. <laughs> <clears throat> I grew up in a town with a population of 200. When I was in high school, I had the good fortune to draw the interest of Reed College in Portland, Oregon. And I fell in love with the notion of going to school there and so I did. And as I'm sure anybody, anybody in this room can well imagine, when I was then in Oregon, I fell in love with Oregon. And I knew I would spend the rest of my life in Oregon. So after college, I was fortunate enough to be able to go to law school at Lewis and Clark in Portland. And uh, while I was there, I know, you know Mr. Carlson mentioned his interest in broadcasting, I, I had the opportunity to be involved in the early days of sports talk radio in Portland at KFXX The Fan. If any of you, if any of you are serious sports fiends, you might recall that, but that was a long time ago, 1990, 91, 92. Uh, but it was great. I, I some shows and I hosted some shows uh, while I was in law school. And I also had the wonderful fortune while I was in law school of meeting a woman by the name of Michelle Rini. And she was kind enough in 1992 to marry me. My, my wife is a, uh, is a juvenile court judge in Washington County. We've been together. We will, we're coming up on our 24th wedding anniversary. Uh, we have an amazing daughter, a young lady who's 18 years old, who's a senior at Aloha High School, Sienna, who's going to be off to college next year, and we really don't know what we're going to do with ourselves when that occurs. My wife is a lifelong resident of Washington County and of Beaverton, born and raised here. And when we got married, um, I moved and joined her and we lived in Aloha. We lived in Aloha for, uh, well, until just a few weeks ago when we moved all the way to Beaverton. <laughs> now, as I said at the beginning, I'm running for the Justice of the Peace of Washington County. The Justice of the Peace presides over the Washington County Justice Court, which is located on uh, Murray and Milliken, for those of you who might not be familiar with it. That, that court handles thousands of traffic violation citations every year, approximately 35,000 per year. Uh, they also, they also handles small claims matters, so that's matters of disputes of no more than $10,000, the court also handles FED matters, or more commonly referred to as evictions or landlord-tenant cases. And then also, and perhaps the most joyous part of the job, 
is you get to do weddings. So that's, that's what, the, what, the, what the job entails. The, um, uh, I'm honored to say that my campaign has drawn wide support in, in, the, in the community, the legal community, as well as the community as a whole. We have the good fortune to have the support of Governor Kate Brown. We also have the good, good fortune to be supported by our most recently retired Chief Justice of the Oregon Supreme Court, Paul Demunez. Uh, here in Washington County, uh, Washington County Commissioner Dick Scouten, uh, State Senator Mark Hass, uh, also the Oregon Labor Commissioner Brad Avakian. With regard to uh, the circuit court judges, eight of the Washington County circuit court judges have endorsed this campaign, um, and four of the county's municipal court judges have endorsed this campaign. I mention these things because oftentimes in races like this, most people, most voters, they don't necessarily know the candidates. It's not the highest profile ticket. There's no TV ads or things like that going on. So I really encourage people to take a look at that. Who are the people that know the lawyers who are running for the office? People who the lawyers appear in front of on a regular basis. Um, I'm proud to say that we have all those endorsements. Uh, my opponent, to my knowledge, does not have any judicial endorsements of any kind. Uh, we also have the support of past Vice President of the Oregon State Bar, Matthew Kehoe, uh, past President of the Oregon Association of Defense Counsel, Larry Brisby, and your own Washington County Public Affairs Forum Vice President, John Tyner. Please, please do not hold that against me. <laughs> now, I believe that the most important thing that any judge can bring to the courtroom is fundamental fairness. Every side and every dispute must be able to have their full say in court on every contested issue and to know that no matter what the outcome is, that they had their day in court. And I will do that in every case. Everyone that comes before me will be treated with dignity and respect. I will run a court with empathy, a court that understands that while the law will be applied and enforced, that we're all human. And very few of us deserve to have the book thrown at us. A court that understands that it has a duty to show compassion when that is appropriate. I think this approach is critical, especially in a court like the Washington County Justice Court. That's a, the type of court, as well as other like municipal courts, where so many of our citizens have their first and oftentimes their only experience with the justice system. And so it is critical that we treat everybody with that fairness, and with that respect, with that dignity, with that empathy, because that is where they will form their first and oftentimes their lasting impression of our justice system. So it's important that it works for them, that they understand that process, and that they have faith in that process. And that's my commitment to the Washington County Justice Court, and that's what I will bring to the position of Justice of the Peace. We have time, we'll just squeeze in one question. Uh, Dan, Harry Bodine Forum member. There was a time in Oregon when uh, the Office of Justice of Peace did not require that the justice be a lawyer. And uh, uh, is that still the case? And number two is, I'm just a real curiosity question, what's the salary of this job? Uh, I'll answer the, the second question first. The salary of the job is uh, $106,000 a year. The, uh, the answer to the, your first question is, it is uh, it is not a requirement under state statute that the justice of the peace be an attorney. But it is a requirement in Washington County for the Washington County Justice of the Peace to be an attorney. And that was, a, that was an action, if my, re if my recollection is correct, that was done by the uh, Washington County Board of Commissioners. And I think that was only as recently as 2010 that that occurred. It might have been 2011. But, it, but it's fairly recent that that, that, that happened. But, but it's a, that is a local requirement and not a statewide requirement, is my understanding. Thank you. Oh, you're certainly welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cross. Appreciate it.
Ladies and gentlemen, next week we will be taking a good look at District 26, and following that we'll be taking a look at the one contested commissioner race with the incumbent Rogers and the candidate uh, uh, seeking to unseat him, Ms. Clay Brooks. So same time, same station next week should be darned exciting. And once again, thank you to our guests today. Really appreciate your flexibility and willingness to share your time with us. Thank you so much. Thank you.